Today's reading comes from 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 1 to 11. Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. As a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. For you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. They are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless, wild living, and they heap abuse on you. But they will have to give account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. For this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead, so that they might be judged according to human standards in regard to the body, but live according to God in regard to the spirit. The end of all things is near. Therefore, be alert and of sober mind, so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply, because love covers over a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others, as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. Here ends the reading. Good morning, church. Allow me to extend my greeting. Um, if we haven't met yet, my name is John. I'm part of the team here at uh, CCB. Uh, if we haven't met you, you'll be surely to meet me even after the service. Um, allow me to also extend my invite as, alongside Bungie to Kids Club. Guys, uh, this is an exciting thing we want to start up, so please uh, do bring your kids along. There'll be a lot of uh, fun things like teaching from the Bible, uh, songs, um, snack time. I know how kids love snacks, so we won't be sure to forget snacks. Uh, and so please, um, next, this upcoming Friday 5, to six, bring them along. And if you're a youth and you're not already part of youth, please do come along from half past six to half past eight. All right, so before I get into God's word, let me ask God to give me the strength and his wisdom to speak. Lord, we do pray. I do pray and ask that you strengthen me and you help me as I deliver your message to your people. God, I have nothing helpful to say to them other than your words. Uh, your passage, even in today's passage, tells us that if we speak, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. And so help their hearts to be receptive to your truth. And we pray, amen. Today, I have one, I have one aim. It's, it's a very simple purpose. Today's passage well, my aim in today's passage is to show how Peter calls the believers to live holy lives in light of Christ's imminent return and God's final judgment. He helps us to see how our way of life, including the way we live with other people, should be different as Christians. We also see how Peter's, how, how, we also see Peter's strong encouragement to the believers to endure suffering as Christ did and leaves us an example to follow. The first part which my fo of my focus is from verse 1 to 6. Uh, we see how believers are called to walk away from sin and follow Christ's pattern of faithful suffering. Therefore, verse 1 says, Therefore, since Christ suffered in his body, arm yourselves also with the same attitude, because whoever suffers in the body is done with sin. If you remember last week when Dave was preaching chapter 3 verse 13, we read about the substitutionary atonement of Christ, that Christ died once for all. He, the righteous, died in place of the unrighteous and was put, his body was put to death on the cross. And through that death, we were made alive in spirit. So it is for those who believe. And so, we saw that he died so that we could come alive to God. Christ's bodily death on the cross achieves 
for us a victory like no other. I say this because the passage says that we should arm ourselves with the same attitude of suffering in the body so that we are done away with sin. This means that just as Christ on the cross defeated the power of sin and death, we too, though we are still sinners and live in a fallen world, we too are able to do with sin, even though we might not be able to do with sin in the same sense as Christ did. But we are able to do away with certain acts of sin. And we see some of those, those uh, sins listed in our passage today. This verse also tells us that there is a, a point where sin will come to an end. Christ came and died so that we could do away with sin, so he could do away with sin. There will come a point where sin will, will cease forever for the Christian. We will also be sinless at some point, but this is only to those who are Christians. But now, as we live in this fallen world, it is not true. We still live in sin. The Romans tells us all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So we are not completely done right now, but there will be a time when we are done away with sin. And our fleshly desires will no longer rule our bodies as they do now. But for now, we can trust that God will help us those who are in Christ, God will help us to do away with certain acts of sin so that we're able to live a life that pleases him, a holy life. Look at verse 2. It says, as a result, they do not live the rest of their earthly lives for evil human desires, but rather for the will of God. You might be asking the question, what does the crucified life look like? Well, the crucified life is living a life of suffering along Christ. And suffering for or with Christ should look like living a more holy life. A life that is for the will of God and not for ourselves. A life that no longer wants what's best for us, but a life that longs to live for the glory of God. A life that loves what God loves. A, love, a life that hates what God hates. We no longer live for our earthly desires and the longings of our sinful hearts. But we live for God, and we live for all that God is. Our heart echoes the words of the prayer, Lord, not my will, but yours be done on this earth. When a believer is willing to endure suffering for the sake of Christ, they show that their purpose in life is not to live for their pleasures, but to live according to the will of God and for his glory. Verse 3, for you have spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do, living in debauchery, lust, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, and detestable idolatry. Peter says to the recipients of this letter that they should do away with their old way of life. He tells them that they should, that they should do away with this old way of life that they once used to live before Christ. He says that they have spent enough time in the past living for their sinful nature. They have spent enough time in debauchery. They have spent enough time in wild living. They have spent enough time in drunkenness. They have spent enough time in idolatry. And in last, and now it's about time that they take the cross of the crucified Christ seriously. And to live, leave that former way behind. The power of the cross is that it can bring change. And when we don't change, we claim that the cross has no power to change lives. We also claim to love sin more than we love our Savior. We bring the crucifixion down to nothing but a fairy tale if we do not change. We are no longer pagans if we believe in the crucified Christ, because our lives are now found in him. We are new creations, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2, verse 17. I mean, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. The old has passed away and the new has come. It is time that we accept that we are nothing but aliens on this earth, as our series has been teaching. We are meant to be different from our non-Christian family, our non-Christian friends, or even colleagues. We no longer desire what we used to desire. 
Christ has given us new desires if we were Christians. Our hearts have been awakened to the beauty of Christ and the life he has called us to. This won't make sense to the non-Christians around us. We know it because even verse 4 says, they are surprised that you do not join them in their reckless wild living and they heap abuse on you. Christianity will come at a cost. The message of the cross costed Christ his life, so for you it will cost cost you something. When I became a Christian not so long ago, actually, well, longness is relative between me and, and most people here. But, um, yeah, when I became a Christian, it, it, it was a difficult decision because I knew that it made me look different to my friends. It costed me my friend group. It, it, it costed me my family in the sense that they looked at me differently. Everything I said and the way I behaved was differently. It made me a bit of an outcast. It came at a cost. It changed the whole direction of my life. At some point... It came with a lot of teasing, a lot of jokes, a lot of people not understanding why I do certain things, how, especially my family. A lot of people saying I'm taking this Christian thing too seriously. Non-believers do not understand the transforming power of Christ's atonement and the response that comes with it. Your decision to live a more godly life and a life that resembles the life of the crucified Christ. And that will mean that you'll be very different in the way that you carry yourself. You'll be very different in the way you carry yourself at the workplace, inside, within your friendship circle, um, it, within your family. The way you think will single you out from the other people in, your, in the room. And this might mean that you face great persecution from people. But not, worry not, because verse 5 says, but they will have to give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. See, so what non-Christians don't realize is that when they slander those people who are living for God, and when they persecute the people of God, it never goes unnoticed. What is done to the Lord's people is done to the Lord himself. God will judge. He will judge those that are living and those that are now dead but once lived. He will judge every act of every person, and no one will escape his judgment. Remember chapter 1, verse 17, um, Peter did say that the Father judges each person's work impartially. There is no favoritism. Verse 6, for this is the reason the gospel was preached, even to those who are now dead so that they might be judged according to human standards regard so that they might be judged according to human standards regarding the body but live according to God in the spirit now when he uses the word dead here in verse 6 it more likely means that dead were those christians to whom the gospel was preached when they were still alive but who have since died so he's not saying that like, like some ideas believe that Christ still went to those who were dead and they were given a second chance to receive the message. No. It's talking about those people that, were still, that, that are dead, but when they were still alive had received uh, or who, the gospel to whom they, it was preached. It is those very people who have died, suffering abuse and persecution that Christ will judge. And praise God that those very people living according to God in the Spirit Those people are living according to God in the spirit. People can do all that they can do to us who are Christians, but they can never take our lives away from us. For as Paul says in Colossians 3 verse 3, for you died and your life is now hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you will also appear with him in glory. I mean, let us consider the example of Christ. In chapter 2, verse 21, 23. To this you are called because Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. He committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. When they hurled insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Instead, he entrusted himself 
to, who, to him who judges justly. So we entrust ourselves in God's hands. We entrust our lives in God's hands. We entrust our persecutors in God's hands. What we focus on is suffering faithfully as Christ left us an example to follow. We will arm ourselves with the same attitude as his and so do away with sin. Verse 11, 7 to 11, Jesus is coming soon, therefore be encouraged to do right by others. The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Friends, if you haven't realized it by now, Christ's return is a sure reality. The call in the next passage is to live our lives in light of Christ's return. And this means that we should be very careful how we treat one another. We need to be very careful how we live with other people. The power of the cross is that it not only does is that not only does Christ give us the power to walk away from sin and the former way of life, but he also helps us to walk in light of a new way of life, to walk in light of the salvation we received in him. Peter helps us to see that we need God's help, and so he urges us to be of a sober mind so that we can pray. We need to get on our knees and beg for God to change us. We need God to help us change deeply within so that instead of living as we did before, God could help us to live in a new way of life, in love, deep love for one another. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Remember in chapter 1, verse 22 to 23, it says, Peter said, now that you have been purified, now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and enduring word of God. We see that deep love for one another has its roots in obedience to the truth of the gospel. We know that in Christ we have been born again, and we are now able to live by the truth, the truth that calls for repentance and forgiveness. We cannot love without forgiveness and repentance, friends. We are compelled to do to each other as God has done for us. And what did he do for us? He had deep and affectionate love for us in that he died on the cross. He died so that we would no longer have to be judged accordingly. When we have harmed or wronged one another, we should seek reconciliation because that is exactly what God did for us on the cross. The power of the cross, the power of the cross to a Christian is that it brings change. The power of true Christian love is that it's anchored on the cross. If you ever notice it, the second part of verse 8 is actually taken from Proverbs chapter 10 verse 12. Where it is written, Hate, hatred stirs up conflict, but love covers over all wrongs. You see, friends, love has no strings attached. It seeks to be restored to the other when conflict arises. It is to this kind of love that we are called to. Verse 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Remember, the context of this letter is to Christians who are being persecuted. You can imagine that amidst the unfriendly and hostile treatment that they are facing, they are and experiencing from the world around them, from the people around them, and from the non-believers. They are called to show hospitality. How much more us? This is hard. This is not a comfortable and natural uh, kind of a thing. It is not going beyond, this is going beyond your comfort zone and going the extra mile to make sure that your neighbor is treated with as, as much dignity as you are. Biblical hospitality has its roots in the message of the gospel, and it is a duty more than a, a suggestion. We are called to be welcoming to all people. All people, no matter who they are, where they come from, what they look like, we are called to be welcoming. 
You are no different from them. Instead, you are more alike to them than you think you are. We are called to have this mindset as Christians rather than to treat each other with animosity. Verse 10, each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Over and above just being welcoming and hospitable, we are called to serve one another with the various gifts that God has given us. So he's taking it even an extra mile, Peter. Please note that this is the only place outside of Paul's writings in the New Testament where the, where the word gift, which is translated charisma, uh, which, yeah, translated in another translation is charisma, is used. The emphasis here is to serve and build up the body of Christ through the gifts that God has given us. Remember that exercising your gift, whatever that gift may be, is an act of stewarding, God's, you know, stewarding what God has given you. Your gift is not for yourself. It is not for you to feel good about yourself. It is not here for you to compare yourself with someone else. It is meant to be used to serve others. We are called to be faithful stewards of God's grace to us. A steward handles whatever has been entrusted to his care faithfully. And so we should arm ourselves with this same mindset. Verse 11 and 12, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength that God gives. They should do so with the, God, the strength that God provides. So that in all things, God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be glory, the glory, the power, and the power in forever and ever. Amen. Lastly, we are called to remember that both our service and our message before men are meant to be channels through which God receives his glory. When we speak, in this sense, speaking about God and the truth of the gospel, whether it be in the same manner as I am at, at the moment, speaking from a pulpit, or it is in a conversation you are having with someone informally, you should remember to speak with extreme care and caution because we are speaking the very words of God. Remember that it is through human authors that God brought about the Bible, and it is in God incarnate Jesus Christ, that we know God speaks to us today. As it is written in Hebrews, in the last days, God spoke through his son. We must realize how great a task is at hand when we are given the opportunity to speak anything about God's truth. We either speak the truth that brings life to those that believe, or we speak heresy and so lead people away from God. You know, it reminds me of a conversation I had yesterday when I was, I was over with, with Banji and a couple of other guys. Uh, we were over and we were having a conversation and um, amongst us was a, a, a Muslim. And I remember just thinking every now, before, every now and again before I said something, how great a responsibility I have here with the words that I'm using. I had to be mindful that whatever I say, whatever I speak, I don't want to risk sharing that, that which is not consistent with the message of the truth. Because what would that mean? It means that I would have uh, shared a message that would have misled him away from God. I would have shared a message that, did, that, that was not helpful for him getting a, a good understanding of the truth of the gospel. And so I was very careful. I wanted to be very careful when I spoke. And I could see that that was the sense of the room. We all wanted to reach out to him. But we, we were very careful with what we said because we understand that when we speak, we speak in the very words of God. And so we had to be very careful with the things we say. And especially to someone who is not a Christian. With regards to serving, the word serving that we see here, um, the Greek word used here Nick will have to help me with the pronunciation, but it's something like diakonos. <laughs> and, and this word, uh, and, and, and if you know the word deacon, it kind of gets its root from this word, which means servant, attendant, or lastly, agent. When we serve people, we need to think of ourselves of God, as God's agents in the way that we serve. God equips us with all the strength that we need to be able to serve one another. 
God does all this so that we will have no reason to boast in ourselves, but so that we will be able to give him all the glory. We are merely vessels through which God can showcase his glory. And so, friends, the way we treat or relate with each other will reflect if we have our eyes set on eternity or not. If we live in light of Christ's return, it should be seen in the way that we love, it should be seen in the way that we speak, it should be seen in the way that we serve, in the way that we suffer, in the way that we live. All these will either point to the cross or all these will either point to ourselves. And so, why don't we just start praying, even now, that God would help us to live life in this way. Because surely we need his help and we cannot do this on our own. So join me as I pray and feel free to pray where you are in your heart that God may help us. Oh Lord, we do need your help. God, firstly to those who do not see this message as anything worthwhile, to those hearts that are still dead, I pray that you would bring, them, bring those hearts alive to your truth. I pray that you would do a work in their hearts this moment and so to awaken them to your love so that they would see the value of living for Christ, the crucified cross, um, the crucified Christ. And so, Father, please help us. Help us to love the way that you have called us to love deeply and to see Christ as an example of that love. Help us also to suffer and follow your example of suffering. That God, you would have your way in us as you would will, God. That we would echo the words of the prayer, Lord, may your will be done in our lives as it is in heaven. God, may you forgive us for those times where we fall short of this call. Where we do not live in a way that pleases you. Where we do not live in a way that we show hospitality to someone else, where we live in a way where we see ourselves above the next person. May you forgive us, God, for where we fall short of this call. Oh, God, may you help us to do away with those sins that, you, that were part of our former way of life and to start reforming our lives in a way that pleases you, that our lives would be aligned to the cross. Oh, God, we would daily repent and daily ask for your strength. That, God, we would have eternity in, in mind. And remember that, God, this is not home. This is not where we are going to end up. There is a place called home, and everything that we do points to that. So, Father, please help us and give us strength. Change our minds and our hearts so that we could live in a way that pleases you. And especially to this world around us, this hostile world, we would show them what Christ, living in Christ looks like that true change would come from our lives. So, Father, we ask all this in your holy and your precious name. Amen.
Friends, it has been great worshiping with you. Thank you so much for joining us. If you're new, please remember to grab uh, a welcome pack like this, fill it in, uh, and then you can give it back to anyone who works for the church. We're going to close with a benediction. And join me as we say it. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Cool.